Yo, what's up guys? In this video, I'm going to be going over and applying what we have learned so far. And I think these kinds of videos are very valuable because it's very easy for me to go into the nuts and bolts and the explanations and the theory of operation of all of these devices. But if you don't see how they are applied in a real setting, you would, you know, kind of get confused. And once I move on from that, it's kind of lost. At least that's how my brain would uh, would work. And my first tutorial series, I did do this. And I think that's why, you know, you would have to kind of work harder to understand. So for lack of a better name, I'm just going to call this an intermission. We're also going to be looking at devices that don't necessarily warrant their own video because their explanation and use is um, very quick to explain and understand. So we're going to be doing that. And we're just going to be looking at some advanced stuff in terms of music making. So let's actually start off by doing a thing here. Let's select one of the MIDI clips and delete one, and then select one of the audio clips and delete that. So we're left with just MIDI and audio. Let's also get rid of the reverb and delay sends. And then what I want to do is go into the audio effects and drop in a limiter. I haven't gone over this yet because it's in my dynamics section, but uh, I'm just gonna drag that into the master channel here. So, that will kind of catch everything and make sure things don't go in the red, which we don't want to do. We don't want things to go over zero. So we put a limiter in there. A limiter is just a very fast thing that reduces volume once it goes over a certain threshold. So there you go. It's very important to have. So we have that. And just for the sake of what I like to I actually like to have these channel strip things a little bit bigger. Right? I like to have the volume fader big so I have lots of control and that looks good to me. I want to save this because every time I open a new set, it'll go to the default one. So this is essentially kind of a beginning introduction to building your first, I guess you would call it, default template. It's a template. It's just something like a workspace that you have. I don't want to put a limiter on the master every time and have these set up like so. So I'm going to save it. So I'll go into options and then preferences. And then I'll go into file folder and I will save current set as default. And I'll overwrite the existing default one. And now every time I hit the new set, um, option in the file menu here, I will get this, which is very useful. And this gives me the opportunity to just have an audio track and a MIDI track available. And I can create more as I go. So let's actually go into the drum rack here. And let's add in some sort of um, kit. All right, we'll just do that. I'll just drag that into the empty MIDI track there. And what else I'll do is I'll just drag in an empty drum rack in there as well. So uh, as I cover devices, I just color code them red by right clicking and selecting the red one. This means devices so far. So these are the ones that we can use. Um, I uh, you know I have all the things that I've used there and this is a good kind of reminder of what we have available and what I can cover. So yeah, we have a drum rack there. I'm just going to move that over. Boom. So it can be with its friend. You can have multiple drum racks. There's no rules necessarily. So let's get some sort of kind of samples in there. I'll go into packs and I'll go into core library. And this project file is going to be available for download uh, below. So you can refresh yourself in uh, what we're doing and you can be like, oh, that's that's that. Okay, cool. And then you can kind of carry on and move stuff around and have some fun. Um, let's go into samples and let's go into drums here and maybe some, I guess, hi-hats. Cool. I'll put one hi-hat there and then I want one that's kind of more closed. 
Yeah, okay. So I'm effectively just using these two cells here, and I want to I want to get a hi-hat thing going on. And I'll just double-click to create a MIDI clip. It'll automatically pop up here, and I can, you know, again, resize that. So we got open and closed. So yeah, I'll just do closed and then opened, right? I'll do that. I'll select these, hit Control D to duplicate, and I can... Yeah, I can kind of take that one out, maybe, and then that one. Let's just see what that sounds like, or hear what that sounds like. And, you know, I can do that. There, cool. So this is called this is called Groove. I'm developing, you know, Groove. And I'll select that, and then that will duplicate like so. I can also, if I want that to kind of play forever and ever, amen, I'll just set the loop point there right and that's the the i mean the end loop point so right now it's looping at half a bar right so it and it's contextual to the rest of the track um no matter what it is because the session view is kind of agnostic towards um you know time it's like an, a different dimension let's get some kicks in there this clip is essentially a bar i mean it is one bar here so let's give that a play All right and let's just get that down there and we will do a little bit of mixing All right so typically kick you know we want the kick to kind of be negative three and you know it's not quite negative three but it's generally accepted that we should bring that up to negative three so i'll go into the 4am kit here and this is the kick kick thud the sample within the pad is set to negative 9 db here in the simpler so i will set the the fader for that whole track to zero and i'm looking at this number right here Looking at this number, actually, I want that to be more contrasty. I'm looking at that number, and I'm going to be moving the volume here, and I want that to be negative 3 dB. And I'll just uh, hit play. And uh, that's the peak. I need to actually reset that by clicking on it, and I'll hit play again. Right, so it's roughly negative 3 dB. That is the kind of the baseline for a kick and things should be kind of mixed around that you can go lower but generally kind of starting out it should be negative 3 db which is what that is and from here you know we can move that up and down if we would like reason why negative 3 is because it gives us a little bit of headroom and generally the bass and the kick need to be the same um, volume, right? And there's different kinds of volumes, different kinds of weighting. There's RMS, there's peak. We'll get into that. But yeah, general rule of thumb is negative three. So we have the kick and then the hi-hats. We need to bring the hi-hats down to an appropriate level. Right? And I like to mix as I go. So this gives us an opportunity to drop in a EQ on that kick. So 808 thud, we'll just plop that down like that. And I'm gonna drop in an EQ8, and it's only for that pad, which is pretty cool. So let's kind of carve that out. And I'm just gonna mute those hi-hats because they're distracting. I'll EQ those a little bit later. Right, I don't typically I I kind of carve out the mid range a little bit because that is generally where you want to focus your attention in your mix. Our ears are most sensitive to this area here and least sensitive to you know higher frequencies. Um, very important to to know that. So this is just generally smoothing things out. Right, just as a starting point. And that works quite well. Um, from here, 
I will, yeah, I'll go into those hi-hats. I want to EQ both of those at the same time. So I'll just double click that drum rack to kind of collapse it and then drop in an EQ8. And, okay, so for these hi-hats, I'll just solo them, right? Hi-hats are, you know, high frequency dependent. I mean, they occupy the higher frequencies, right? Hi-hats, they're, you know, tiny symbols that occupy higher frequencies. And when you're mixing, it's a good idea to kind of clear things up in the areas that other instruments want to occupy. And it, it's generally accepted that you high pass things that need to be high passed, but you don't need to high pass everything. But for the sake of starting out, let's just high pass these hi hats here. Right? And you will hear a negligible difference. Right? But we're getting rid of all that schmutz on the bottom. Right? That doesn't make any sense and shouldn't be there. Right? And we can see that in our analyzer here. Right? And we can high pass that. And we can high pass even more. Right? But then we lose the body of that hi hat. So we have to bring it back. And this delves into mixing and mastering, but it's important to kind of wrap your head around it. Um, instead of high passing it, if it's too harsh, just give it a little bit of attenuation after that. Right, let's just get rid of the two band here. Just do that and see what it sounds like. Right, and I'll turn the band three on and off. Right, so as opposed to like filtering all that out, we're just kind of making it a little bit more gentle. And this is sculpting and control. And you can, you know, get really into it and stuff like that. And this is essentially mixing. Um, you're going to be making choices depending on what's going on later on down the road. But this is a good starting point. Right, and it's the balance between the kick and the hi-hats here. Right. Hope that uh, makes sense. I'm just going to give us a little more headroom on that master there. Hope it's not too loud. And let's move on. That is, you know, some basic uh, drums and percussion there. Um, what we can do now is let's drop in our old friend, the analog. Right. And we're going to create a bass line. So I'm going to double click on that. And I'm going to pick a note. We can see the notes there that value changing, and I'll just select G, and I'll just move it over here. I'll kind of zoom in a little bit. Let's just see what that sounds like, right? And, you know, it sounds not like what we want there because of the amplifier kind of doing that with the release. So I'll just have it, the, the, the envelope for the amplifier just open and close, no release. And you know, it's a little bit too high, but I still want it to be G. So what I can do is I can actually select that, hold shift and then press down and it'll just go up and down G. So the G1, G0, right? G2, right? It'll, it'll go down a full octave, right? So it's still, it's still G, but it's an octave down. And this delves into basic audio theory, but I hope you get it. So, I'm going to get into some interesting automation here, and I'm, I'm priming you for, you know, workflows that you're going to use down the line. I want this bass to be <clears throat> all-encompassing, right? Just going on forever. So kind of like this, all right? But there's a lot going on there. And I'm going to do some stuff here. I'm going to delete this three audio here, and I'm going to move all this to arrangement because I feel that that's uh, very important for kind of getting things going. And I can always go back to session to work on these ideas and then bring them back 
right? You can use a session and arrangement at the same time. It's not you transfer things over and then you've committed to that. No, you can go back and forth. You can use some tracks in a uh, timeline agnostic manner and then some as a uh, session, kind of like a linear timeline thing. But let's select this scene. So this scene right here, number one, this is the scene one. And let's just drag that into this top right corner. Oh, there we go. And then we will drag that in there. And then boom. So these are grayed out because um, these tracks are essentially playing in session, right? They're not playing in arrangement. Uh, and that is basically saying that, okay, so arrangement is still happening. These are still armed to play. So we'll just disable that track in terms of its abilities to um, produce sound in the session view, right? You can't have both at the same time. So how you reset that, we can kind of set the kick to be in arrangement by clicking this triangle here. And this says uh, in the bottom left info window, single track back to arrangement. So we'll do that. Boom. It becomes uh, non grayed out. And we have the ability to control that um, and oh, hear that uh, kick there. All right, so we're still hearing the hi-hats and the bass there. And that's because they're armed to record, or armed to play, I should say, when transport occurs. But the kick is in its uh, arrangement mode. So it'll start playing once it gets to here, essentially. All right, so we can kind of... We'll get into this later using the arrangement and the session uh, modes at the same time, but that's basically it. We click this uh, orange button here. It'll just take everything back to arrangement, essentially uh, stop arming these to play. And there we have our clips that we made. And the hi-hats are half a bar, like how we set it, right? So I can change I can duplicate this to make it a full bar full bar sorry and I can right click and then consolidate this right select them both and then consolidate and they will become one MIDI track right a little bit of a magic trick and one of the important things to kind of wrap your head around and, and understand is when you drag a clip anywhere uh, Clips are independent, no matter what, right? So if I have this clip here for analog three and I copy, or I'll just duplicate, it'll duplicate one below, and I have it here, and then, you know, I change this one. It doesn't affect the initial one, right? And this is really important. Like you would think that, you know, it would kind of be a global clip and you know you change one it changes the other it doesn't work that way so we move the clips to here and then change them they don't reflect over here so keep that in mind um, that's one common misconception when working with live but anyway let's select this area and loop it right so this will loop forever and ever amen right and there's a lot of stuff going on here so let's do some Basic automation. We're gonna do something called ducking. So I'm gonna get rid. I'm just not. I'm not gonna get rid. I'm gonna mute the hi hats here, and I'm just gonna rename that so we know. And I'll name this. Yeah, we'll just keep it 4 a.m. kick. So this is a common technique. It'll be very recognizable. What we're gonna do is we're going to kind of make this kick kind of pump every time the kick occurs. And for people who are somewhat uh, well seasoned, I'm not gonna do what you think I'm gonna do. That is for a different video, but there's a perfectly acceptable way to do it in a way that I'm gonna show you. And that is with volume automation. So we have the analog here, so I'll just call this a base, All right? So we'll go into the channel here and what I want to do is I want to introduce a new device. I'm going to audio effects and go down to utility. Utility is very useful. I mean, that's why it's called utility. It does a number of things, some things uh, more easily understandable than others. I'll just click that. So 
What it does is it has a gain control and a left-right balance control, right? It also has a mute button, and it also has the ability to, um, I guess, filter out DC offset. DC offset is, I guess, not, it's not something you need to necessarily worry about, um, but it will come into play a little bit later. This delves into, you know, audio and DSP, more advanced stuff. You don't need to really worry about that. But mute, essentially, will mute the track, right? And gain will adjust the gain of the track. Right? And this is a good way to do something called gain staging. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and that should be very well. We can pan. Right, pretty cool. And all those sort of things. Let me briefly just open this up here and I'll just get the unison going on here. All right, so I, I have unison going. And what that does, again, is that um, splits this up into two analogs and then has one panned all the way left and then all the way right. And they are detuned from each other so it sounds like a wider sound. And this utility allows us with this width knob to adjust that width. We can also mono it, which essentially uh, just collapses the left and right into a center frequency there. Right, so we've got unison going on. We can turn mono off. And that's all well and good. We can adjust the width to increase the uh, overall width of that. And I'm, I believe what it does is it essentially applies math and you know amplifies the signals that are different from each other um, when I'm talking about, I mean, left and right different. And then the width will kind of collapse it, but not really. So you get to control the width. And remember when I was saying that there's, there's ways to look at audio? Um, I want to give you kind of a brief introduction, right? So again, there's frequency domain and time domain. We've been looking at those to analyze audio. There's actually another one, and that would be, I guess, the way to measure stereo width. And I'll show you what that is. This is this is pretty neat. What it does is it just measures the left and right difference, right? And I'll just kind of do that. That's actually... Let's go, let's go more voices. Oh goodness. And we can see um, a correlation there. Actually, I'm not gonna use this one. I mean, um, no, we don't need to rotate. I don't wanna overwhelm and confuse, but just trust me, there is a, <laughs> there is a way to uh, measure these things. And these are done with some mastering grade um, analyzer tools. So scratch that whole idea. I don't want to get into that right now. That's in that's in the mixing and mastering. So, but the the idea is is that you have two speakers. You know, two two speakers on your head, two speakers in front of you. Music is generally stereophonic, and you want control over the differences in left and right, and you want things to be panned things to be center, you want certain frequencies to be center, and that wa that's why this bass mono is there. What that will do is that will essentially kind of guarantee that the lower frequencies are mono and then the higher frequencies are wide, depending on what's going on, right? And this is useful because lots of stereo width on the low end just sounds wacky. And it can cause some weird phasing stuff just because the frequencies are so low, the the waves are so far apart. It, it can it can cause some nightmares. So just keep that in mind. But the utility, what we're going to be looking at is the gain here. We'll look at uh, the um, phase a little bit later. I also want to mention you can select what what um, what it will output. So right now it's outputting stereo. Stereo comes in, stereo comes out. We can have it set to left, where just the left will come out. 
or the right will come out. And this is useful for um, a certain audio, and we can swap the left and right. So really, really useful there. So let's go back to stereo. Again, it has the gain here. Gain is very useful because we're going to be doing some cool stuff with that gain. So we're going to have that gain set at 0, 0. I'm going to right click and go show automation. And we're showing the automation in this here. And what I want to do is I essentially want to do something called sidechain compression, but we're not using the sidechain aspect of it. I'll be covering that later. We're going to be using, I guess, a technique called ducking or volume automation. So let us do that. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to select the pencil tool and I want to set this to, I guess, eighths, right? So I want to select this part and go down to in negative infinity, right? And this will give me a good baseline of, no pun intended, this will be a good, this will give me a good starting point. And I, you can't really see it. There you go. So you can see it. It's kind of off and then on. So what I'll do is I'll actually loop this part, right? I don't want to do this for all of them because I'm going to be working on this particular part here. Let's give it a, let's give it a listen. Right, so it's kind of just going off and on, on the offbeat. And I'll turn off unison, I'll give us some uh, filter here. Right, pretty, uh, pretty cool. Let's shape this, because right now it's kind of binary. You know, it's just off and on. But what if I took this point and snapped it over there, what would happen? Well, it would sound like this. And I'll boost that uh, volume just a little bit. Right? And what that is, that's essentially the most widely used effect in electronic music. And it's a form of mixing, really. When the kick happens, the volume is, you know, down, and then it rises up to full power on the offbeat. All right? Let's take this a step further. I'm going to actually have that filter completely open, and I'm going to go into the auto filter. Right? So we have just simple kind of saw wave with the utility here, and I'll just solo it. And what I want to do is I want to bring that down. And I've been hinting, I've been hinting at the um, circuit types within these filters. And I'm going to go maybe over them in detail in later videos, but let's say I want to add some kind of you know where we're talking about saturation and transfer functions? Well, these are built within analog filters. Well, not transfer functions, but they are non-linear, especially if you feed more sound into them that they can't handle that well. In the digital realm, remember we were clipping, right? We get You get digital clipping, and it just rounds it off. With a filter, when you drive or feed back, you get this kind of lovely saturation within the filter circuit. And these are extremely useful, and there's a number of different ones. So right now, so far, we've been using the clean filters. Right? That sounds all well and good. Let's select a different filter. And there's a number of them, and they're all based on the very awesome work by uh, Cytomic. And they actually have designed devices for Ableton Live because they sound so good, and they very accurately model this equipment. Um, he went ahead and modeled these filters, and then he was hired and he applied these filters to a lot of the filters within live and they do some 
very special things. And the world of analog filters, it's super complex. Like there's um, a bunch of white papers. Those are, you know, research papers that are published on how to do this. And filters are pretty wacky because they can do a thing called self oscillation. And once, you know, once we get into like the Moog filters, you're going to be like, what the heck's going on here? So let's go, I get MS2. MS2 is the most obvious. This is based on, I guess I can say it. It's based on, you know, the Korg MS20. And there is this smudginess that it can achieve. Daft Punk has used this filter a lot. Uh, because the MS-20, if you, if you look at it, there is an external end. They would run um, audio through it and then filter it out. This is how French House was born. But it has this ability to drive. Like if you feed it a signal that it can't handle, You're doing something you are not supposed to do. Whoa. So we're getting some saturation there. I'm going to add another utility because I cannot necessarily adjust this i don't want to right i don't want to touch it so i'll go back into the audio effects here i'll just drag in the utility and i will bring that down and right this is a, a another thing you need to wrap your head around when you are processing and i don't want to sound condescending when i say that when i say wrap your head around i'm saying you know i struggled with this and it's easy to get a runaway effect so when a lot of times in the in the world when you when you when you where's my hand when you turn a knob you're supposed to compensate with another one right counterclockwise to your clockwise and vice versa right so as we increase the drive we need to bring down the gain right so we're getting some smudginess there let's increase the frequency a bit Right. And don't worry that this is kind of redlining a little bit. Um, live has a lot of headroom. You don't need to, it goes way above zero and it's super high quality. It's very difficult to actually uh, clip within Ableton Live. It, I've, you, you can try it, it's very difficult. So don't worry, everything works in, I think it's like a 64 bit engine so that's a lot of ones and zeros that can represent audio and it's a float like don't don't even don't even worry about that and using um vst modern vsts it used to be an issue especially you know back in back in the back in the day it couldn't you know they would they would actually clip but now they can handle it so but it's always a good idea to kind of stage it before you plop it into something just out of habit and safety, but we're getting some smudginess there. We can increase the resonance. Right, and we can change the filter type. We get a completely different response. So something's happening is it's kind of resetting all the time. I don't want that so i'm going to go into the volume here and just go glide and legato always and i'll go mono and then i'll give it uh you know a bit of a release here right cool all right so that's that's Good. So the, the clickiness is kind of at the beginning. We don't really need to worry about that because we're going to be side chaining that out. All right. That's very that's very ringy actually. I don't want that. Okay, whatever. So that's what those filters were, will do, and it's controlled by the drive here. So let's add the utility. Right. There's that, uh, that smudginess. Let's add in an EQ8 after that utility because we don't want the EQ8 to be blasted like that. We want it kind of after, right? Right, and it, it sounds quite lovely. And 
what I like to do, I like to actually take this shelf here and then kind of accentuate what's going on in the upper frequencies. You can go either, you know, as extreme or kind of unextreme as you want. But yeah, it's, it's, you're, just a, you're just having a play around here. And we can set it to uh, 12 dB per octave to be a little bit more accurate. Uh, I like this one because it's based off the, uh, the Juno or the JP8000. It's a ladder filter. just does a really special thing to the audio. Let's listen to what that sounds like. And let's bring up the BPM. Yeah, we'll go 126, why not? Right, I'm gonna leave that because I like that shaping there. I'm gonna drag in another EQ, EQ8, right? And I'm just gonna shave out some of that. Pretty cool, and uh, that's essentially that kind of workflow. So you'll notice that if we go to this gain here, click on it, it will reappear, or we can go into this drop-down menu. But let's say we want that to always kind of be visible. We can click on this plus button here, and it will create a automation lane for that, and that will always be there essentially so i want this to be copied over to the rest of these but first i want to make this kind of more curved i guess it's too linear for me i don't like it so i'll just hold alt and you'll notice the cursor changes to like this curve thing i can actually just bend that down so it's you know more smooth i guess right so it's like right that's uh, pretty neat. And I can also do some fun things. I can actually, once I have this part selected, I can select this area and kind of make it longer or shorter and kind of adjust the scale. Uh, but I don't want to do that for this particular one, so I'll just uh, hit Control Z to go back. But I do want to duplicate this so it kind of continues along here because right now it's set to only every quarter. So I'll select that part and I'll just hit Control D, Control D, and then Control D. Right. And what Control D does is it will just duplicate this area and the start point of that duplication will be the end of the selection. Remember that. So if we select this area, hit duplicate, it'll do that. So I'll just click that off. And yeah, that's automation lane, curved automation, and all of that. So I'll turn off automation mode, which gives me the ability to, you know, not have to worry about the automation lines anywhere. But then when I want to go back in, boom, there's my automation, there's my automation lane for something that is uh, important and that is super fun. So, all right, so let's look at I had uh, down here the hi hats. Right. Let's work on these hi hats just a tiny bit. I'll solo them. And what I want to do is I want to go into devices so far, and I'm just going to put in a delay. And you'll notice that I'm the the order of these effects are kind of very important and. In a lot of instances, the order of them will affect how they behave. So let's say, you know, having the delay after something like distortion will just have the delayed kind of wet effect. But the delay before distortion, right, the delayed signal will be sent into the distortion. The distortion will kind of behave differently because more stuff is being fed into it. And the over time you will become familiar with essentially workflows and how things are um, you know uh, the order of things that you should kind of have and typically out of habit i will have just the eqs depending on what i'm doing near the end 
right? And it's really cool because an EQ is essentially, it works in the frequency domain, right? Remember, it's in a different dimension completely. So me having the EQ8 before or after this delay will make no difference whatsoever um, because delay works in a time domain, right? Um, a saturation plugin or, you know, a redux or e even an overdrive. Like, you know what? I think it's best if I just demonstrate it. So we have the overdrive here. And uh, all of that fun stuff right there. Right. We can have the overdrive before or after the EQ. It'll change. Right, because just it, what's being fed into the overdrive is being changed by the EQ weight. I'll make that even more apparent if I have something like that. Right, so it really depends on what's going on, right? Overdrive and EQ8 are operating in the frequency domain, right? So I hope that makes sense, right? It, it really depends on the, on the order of what you want to do. So yeah, let's get the delay in there again. And yeah, let's unlink these and have, you know, two and then three. Let's just see what that sounds like. Whole bunch of stuff on that high end. I'm going to roll that off just a tiny bit. I'll bring down the feedback. Right. All well and good there. All right, let's work on this bass a little bit. And I think this is a good time to open up the auto filter again and be like, hey, I want to do some LFO stuff here. I want this to move around a bit. And we can do that and we'll do some sort of driving situation there. So right now it's the shape is a sine wave. I want it to be a ramp down, boom, ramp down. And I want it to essentially synchronize with the host BPM 126 and it'll do sixteenths. And again, LFOs are just oscillators that change values, like automatic value changing over time. And you have speed or rate and all of that fun stuff. And there's the amount or depth that you want it to um, affect things. Right. So what we have done effectively, we have uh, changed the behavior of the whole sound post. So we'll get into that a little bit later. But this is a, this is a good way to understand how modulation can make a boring sound sound more interesting and how automation can be a creative effect. It could be a mixing tool. It can be a whole bunch of things. Right? So we can take that, we can move the frequency down if we want. And let's automate that frequency. And let's just uh, select, oops. Let's select uh, a empty part here, right? Auto filter frequency, right? We clicked on it. We can confirm that we are, we have it selected. And what we can do is we can Bring that up. Right, and we can select, we can just uh, actually select this, hold shift, and we can bring that down and have some fine control over that. Or we can select this top part here and bring it down. So multiple ways to go about doing things. Let's 
take this a step further. And this is why automation lanes are so useful. We have a basic reference. And I'm going to give this a different color just so we can kind of see. It's a little bit uh, annoying looking. I want to actually, there we go. We can see the automation in greater detail. We can automate the shape as well. And I'll just, you know, select that. Or I can go into the drop down menu and select LFO waveform. Drop down menus are kind of tricky to select. I can, yeah, actually, no, they're not that tricky at all. So right now, we are, yeah, we have the ramp down selected. I want to have ramp up, but for this ending part. So where's that? That is a kind of a value up. I'm going to select this area here and hold shift, and I can just move that up and it will snap. It snaps. And we can see, look at the shape in the bottom left, auto filter, that shape, it's changing, right? And I can change it to any, so it snaps to the value, it's contextual, which is super useful. I wanna know what that sounds like. All right, let's give that its own automation lane. And let's select a rate. And you notice that when I select rate down here, the grid is shown. And there's a readout on the side here. So actually, I'll just select this and I'll, I'll see what's going on. So it's 124. Maybe I'll go 32, like the, the rate will change. Right. And I'll uh, hold shift, select this area, hold shift, and I can bring that up. And the number is there, right? The number is there, it tells me. So this would be maybe like an eighth. Right, we have all this automation going on, and it's super duper fun. Let's get that pen in there, and we can do some of this kind of stuff. We're getting some groove in there and I'm moving this around but you can't hear it because of the automation down here. And this is just a super useful way of looking at automation and it becomes second nature as you develop these things. And with the lanes, you can very easily see all the things that are going on here. So we got LFO sync rate, uh, waveform selection, uh, the auto filter frequency, and the uh, gain down here. And it's all relevant to what is in the track. Right, super, uh, super fun stuff. So, yeah, let's move on a little bit here. Let's get some audio tracks in there. We can go into places again. And wood, I don't know, wood's fun. Right, so we have this and you'd be like, what is that doing? And I'll actually turn off automation mode. What is, like, what is, what is this thing here? You know what I mean? Like, why are you putting this in here? Well, what we can do is we can select, uh, hover over this top area, hold shift, nope, hold, nope, alt, it's alt, isn't it? No, no it isn't, how would I, um, see this is new, shift and drag edges, it'll stretch the clip, if I shift, drag edges, oh, you know what, I, need to, I actually need to warp it, so this idea, we're not going to be exploring that much yet. It involves warping, which is one of the more tricky aspects of working with audio in live. 
But what we can do is we can actually go into this clip view here and we'll set this and we'll bend this up and down this transpose here. This will set the pitch of that uh, piece of audio. Right, and we can kind of explore and pitch things up and down. And this is like the secret of a lot of really cool effects is you take something like a wood block, double click, and you pitch it down. Right, and we'll do this here, and I'll duplicate that, and I will pitch this down even more. So, right, we have independent control over these two clips here. Right, and this is, we're getting into the world of kind of call and response, but let's do some cool stuff in terms of processing with this here. One thing I like to do is I like to put things in a space. And we do that with reverb, right? Remember reverb? And I'll put it in a very large space. And I'll drop in a, you know what? I'll just drop in a, no, a channel EQ to kind of shave some fun stuff off there. Right? And that's all well and good. Let's break out of this loop here. What I want to do is I want to select everything and then hit Control D, D, D. Right? And that will essentially break it out into a longer form idea. Right? And this is, you start with an idea and you branch outwards. And we will be introducing some things in here which are pretty cool. Right? Look at that perk wood. Let's get a delay in there before the reverb. And this delves into the idea of uh, uh, time-based stuff. The delay being fed into the reverb will sound different than the reverb being fed into the delay. And, you know, typically I have the delay being fed into the reverb. What it does is it gives, I guess, this um, kind of richness and... Um, rhythmic bounciness to the reverb, which I like. Right? Sounds pretty cool, but delay after the reverb has a different vibe. Right? And, you know, if, if we get into more kind of uh, extreme values, that becomes more apparent. So, the you know, again, it's important what is being fed into what. Right? Let's do some stuff and have the time and the feedback doing some weird things. This is an effect that's really fun. Right? And with the repitch snap mode, it does some really cool stuff. So let's turn on the automation. And, you know, the bass automation, I collapsed. And I, I do that out of habit because I don't want to see all that right away. And you'll notice that uh, copying over the automation. No, duplicating the clip also copied over the automation as well. You have control over the automation and the clip separately. But for the sake of this video, I want to make it easy. Um, and we've already kind of copied over automation. You can also just quickly, you can lock the automation with this lock here. And the automation will be independent of the clip. So keep that in mind. Uh, locking the automation is very useful for, um, say, if you have, I guess, automation that you really like and you want to drop in different kinds of samples or drop in a loop or move some things around. You don't want the automation to move around. You can actually lock it. And this is an excellent tool. You don't need to kind of draw it back in. Let's uh, collapse that bass track again. And let's look at this Perkwood thing. And we'll look at the uh, time, and we'll just actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to record some automation. And how you do that is you just play it, and I can manually move this automation here. And in order to do that, I just make sure that this automation arm button is on, right? So if I, I can 
essentially just hit record. Right, and I've effectively recorded that in. And if you didn't see that, I'll select the automation and then go, I guess, uh, clear envelope. So no more automation there. What I'm, gonna, what I'm doing is I don't even have to have this arm to record. When this automation arm is enabled, you hit record and it will listen to all values. And this is super duper useful. So let's, uh, let's do that. Right, so I'm, I'm automating that time. And look at that, look, that looks pretty neat. And what I did is I gave myself a lead in, right? So I could kind of hit record and then press play, and then that will give me enough time to go down here to prepare to uh, manipulate that value. So some cool things um, happen is it'll, it'll create a point when you move it. But if you actually wanted to smooth that out, you'll select all of that. And then you'll go simplify envelope and that will kind of simplify it and truncate it to curves and all that fun stuff so you can have a an easier time editing and things like that and i'll just uh, click on those to move that i'll click on that and then i want to maybe curve that up so um it's more of a smoother transition and this one's still sharp so you can use kind of both options there to have a really cool kind of delay effect. Right, just for the sake of, I guess, example. So from here, what we can do is, yeah, let's get that kick a little bit more beefy. We can do that with, say, pedal so pedal is pretty nice it allows us to introduce some hefty distortion right we can engage the uh, sub it'll give us a low frequency boost right we'll have distort and we'll adjust the wet dry here Right, but you know, this doesn't give us a whole lot of control. And I'm gonna get into something called an effect rack, which is very useful. So let's say we wanted to have control over the pedal and the dry signal, more so than just a wet dry amount. Well, there's a really fun way to go about doing that. We're actually going to right click and then select group. Right. So this, what this does is this will group whatever you have selected into a, a contained, I guess, device. So you can have devices within a device, and then you can hit uh, the, the save icon here, and it will save that device. What it also allows you to do is it allows you to do some interesting routing. Like Remember how we did the routing in the drum kit? How we were routing things around and having sends and stuff like that, and I drew that out. What we're effectively doing in this group here, especially when we open up the, the drop down um, chain menu here, right? This has macros as well. And so it should be, you know, very somewhat familiar. Like a drum rack is a rack for drums, for the drum pads. It's purpose built for that. An audio effect rack is built for audio effects, right? And there's a number of chains, and right now we have one, and what we kind of selected is the chain, and I'll just rename this to pedal. Right? This is the pedal chain, right? And we can solo it, and you know, it, it does the thing that it's supposed to do. Right, all sorts of fun stuff. We can actually right click and then create another chain. And this chain is empty. And this chain is ex is essentially its own separate. Okay, so what happens? Right, so we have um, the, you know, we have the, we have the audio going this way, right? And what the chain 
is doing is you have the ability to split this signal into its own separate thing. And this will be something, this will be, no, be a little more descriptive. This can be an effect, another thing, another thing. This can be another one, and this could be another effect, and then another effect, all within these chains. And then these, each of these has a ability to mix Right, it has the ability to, you know, set the level, the pan, on, off, solo, and then you can hot swap uh, presets, which is pretty nice. And then these are essentially summed back together into a single track, and this is called pair. No, I'm not gonna. It's called. I'm not gonna draw the comparison, but essentially. <laughs> there's uh, parallel processing and then there's serial processing so parallel would be one one effect uh, and another effect right so audio comes in the audio is split and then those are sent out or they're kind of put back together serial is kind of what we've been working with so far is just effects are sequentially Put in to get so you get the idea so parallel is like you know things are operating in parallel serial is just you know sequentially um, one led into another and you can imagine you know if the order matters of how you have things going into one another having things in parallel is also important and with pedal and you know reverb and delay there's already parallel processing built within them, right? With the wet and the dry, right? It's split up and one goes into the, one signal goes into the, you know, the reverb processing area. And then the other just goes straight through and then you have the ability to mix them both together as you see fit or have just have one or just have the other. It's pretty cool. So let's go back into here. All right, so we have pedal, and then the chain, this would be the dry, right? So we effectively have wet dry. So what's the point of this? Well, we can have the pedal here. We can have it an extreme value and we can do something that just regular wet dry would not allow us. We can add in the EQ, right? And we can kind of shape things a bit. And uh, yeah, let's kind of roll that off. Right, and so we're just kind of preserving the mid-range sort of thing. All right, that's cool. Right, we want that that low end kind of thing going on, and yeah, why not? Just for fun, what we can do is. Yeah, let's give it a little bit of um, redux. Right, just to give it a little bit of dirt. And that is in its own chain, but we don't have, like alone, these would not have the ability to have wet dry within them. But we can now because we can actually bring this pedal volume down, turn on the dry, which is the dry signal, right? Nothing is in there. And then we can mix this in. Right, and you can go and you can do all sorts of things with this. You can have this effect rack and you can have things doing some parallel stuff and then you can have another rack doing, you know, serial stuff and then you can go back to parallel. So much routing can be done and then you can have racks within racks and just do some absolutely bananas processing and get really convoluted, but that's, you know, a different... Um, video for another day. So we have that and it's all well and good. Let's grab an EQ8 in there. Let's listen to that, what it sounds like all together. All right, let's change this delay here. I wanna have this actually change to the time 
I mean, so it's from time to like being synchronized. Right, so how would I do that? Well, that's effectively disappeared for the most part. And what I can do is I can go into these um, buttons here and it'll be like, okay, so this would be the, the, the left um, 16th chooser. So let's hit the B button, or, yeah, our B key, and we can actually drag some things in here. And now we're getting into like complex mode, right? We're changing the time here, and we'll, we can see that when I hit play. that a three maybe two it just sounds completely weird then I can switch between modes if I wanted to. And, you know, we can just kind of imagine the uh, possibility. So I'm switching between the sync and the time modes here. Right, all in that delay there. So there's absolute freedom and a lot of interesting things there. So what are we looking at here? An hour and six minutes. Let's continue. So we have went over all of that. What we can do here, let's add in something for these hi-hats. Because, yeah, let's just add in a filter. And, you know, pre-delay. Right, so I have this uh, frequency here. I want to have this frequency moving about, right? Because it sounds cool. And what we can do in Live 10 now is we can select an area and then right click, and then we have an insert shape, right? And we can insert a sine wave. This should look somewhat familiar, and we can modulate stuff with this sine wave, right? And we can, you know, take this area, we can drag it, and we can make it smaller, and we can grab that, and move that up, kind of give it some offset, move things around, and, you know, you know, drawing in a sine wave in there would be kind of uh, difficult, but that's just one example. Um, let's drop in, you know, we can add in some, you know, a ramp down, which would be, you know, pretty easy square. But here's something that's really cool is we can select, we'll set this, the, gra the graph to 16th, is we can actually draw in an envelope, right? So this will create an envelope, right? And many fun things can be had with these, like, extremely useful. Right. So we need to actually adjust the, the scale of this. So we'll just do this and then do this because you don't want that filter to sweep like bananas, right? And what I'll do is I will uh, duplicate this automation here. Let's just, oops, let's just give it, uh, give it a listen. Right, all sorts of fun stuff. And we can select yeah, yeah, you know what, I'll just move that up there, right, and maybe it can have this one here, and I can maybe change that, right, so these are envelope based, which will give you a, a different sound and vibe here, right, and I want all these to kind of be different. Right. Uh, select filter again. And, uh, yeah, I'll take all that. I can move that down. 
very cool. Okay, so we have that right there, and this is when we're getting into super kind of complex automation here, right? So, so much automation. Give it some resonance. Right, we got some we got some stuff going on there, and it uh, it interpolates. So with automation, because it kind of snapped up there, we have to remember that, you know, it will kind of round off things. We'll just kind of set the automation so it doesn't go that high. And that bass, because we're building the track, I want to shave off some more things. And I added in a new EQ. Um, I shouldn't be doing that just for the sake of these videos. Um, I use EQs in series as I go along, but I'll just kind of round off the top end here. Give me an example of automation. I'm gonna actually freeze this automation here. And if I look in the delay, there's all sorts of stuff going on in the delay. What I can do if when I freeze the automation is I can move this and the automation will not move. And this will give me the freedom to move things around and still keep that automation, even though it sounds kind of meh, but it's one of those flexibilities that we can have here. A lot of cool stuff you can do with filters and automation and all of that. Let's get the kick and the bass in a group. Right, so we're effectively putting that in a group there because they really want to be together. And this is a, a general workflow. And we can do a bunch of stuff with this. Um, for example, you know, EQing them together to achieve a tonal balance between them. Right, and we can roll off that top end just a tiny bit. Right, those are hi-hats. I want to jump in and give it a bit of overdrive because I like the way that sounds. got a little bit of attitude in those hi-hats. They don't even resemble hi-hats anymore, but we added that overdrive. I need to shape things a tiny bit more. Right? Let's take this, and let's take this a little bit of a step further. So I have effectively turn those hi-hats into a percussion loop sort of thing. And I want to use this opportunity to just kind of render these in place with all the effects. That's essentially what I'm about to do. I will right-click on this, and I will go Freeze Track. And what this does, what freezing does is this will essentially render it in place and then play it back from disk or memory 
it doesn't need to computate all of the processing that you put in the track and that'll free up some cpu and you know i spent a lot of money on a computer so that i wouldn't have to worry about cpu usages so i i don't really do this but if you get you know a synth with like a lot of oversampling or a really you know complex advanced effect or a lot of stuff going on you know you might want to freeze it and it will always be there when you need it and then you can unfreeze and it'll go back to normal right so that's what freezing is but the, the only um the only downside of freezing is you can't adjust these things on the fly uh, automation's there but you can't kind of adjust things you only have control over the overall volume so from here we can actually print this audio we'll right click and then we will go flatten and flatten in you know in photoshop when you have all your layers of images flatten means that you'll just take all those things and then just put them in one layer you're flattening something right and this is essentially printing what is frozen into a track and it'll convert this midi into the drum rack into this filter all the automation all that fun stuff into a series of clips and it's really smart how it does this right so we have a bunch of these right all kind of split up into bar loops and then we have a tail it'll render out the tail as well because there was some you know delay uh, and some stuff like that within it but if we double click and zoom in here look at the clip here we zoom out it's just selecting a area that was already there so with that said this is how clips are super useful because you can have all of this information within them and you know if you don't need them we don't need the tail in the perceivable future that can be kind of hidden i can actually get rid of all of these but these are all still the same clip like if you zoom in that tail is right there and if i want that tail i can just move over and select that area i mean not so much do that, but I can select this and then stretch it out. So it's always good to to know that, the, the power of clips and all those fun things that are going on. So this is the freeze of those hi-hats, right? Super dope, and I can just duplicate that, and I have a new track here. There's something else I want to do. I want to go into packs and I'm going to add in another, I'm going to add in hi, a hi-hat as audio because my hi-hats are now percussion elements and that's just, that's just how she goes. Right, and I'm just going to drag those in and they are there on every offbeat. Okay, and I'll just bring that down in volume. Right. Let me show you the power of consolidating, right? So I have this uh, hi-hat here. And a really cool thing that I like to do is I like to actually select an area, right? So this is a quarter. So I have selected a quarter. I can right-click there, and I can go consolidate. And what consolidate will do is it will merge multiple files within each other. And it will also trim files. We can consolidate a bunch of MIDI clips into one MIDI clip and everything within that will be preserved. If I consolidate on this, it will consolidate the audio and it will add, you know, negative audio space to the beginning here. And this is something that I do because I come from a time where Ableton Live would run out of RAM <laughs> a lot. and if you had like a lot of these clips along the entire track, each one of those is, you know, there's a start and an end point and all that fun stuff. Everything perceivably was loaded into RAM. It, you know, it would have to do a bunch of stuff and it would kind of slow it down. Now that is not so much of an issue, but I've carried on that habit because that's just the way I work. And you'll see why it's useful. So I have this hi-hat here. 
And what this is, is this is a, the length is a quarter bar, right? And we can see that right there. What we can do is we can actually select loop, right? And then the loop point is here and check this out. We can stretch this out for the whole duration of that instead of having individual ones uh, speckled along there. And this is one of those workflows that I like looking at. Or I like using and kind of preaching. And, you know, we can kind of do some divisions here or whatnot. All sorts of things can be done there. And this is the power of consolidating. This will consolidate it into a new file as well. And, uh, you know, you can look at this and play around with it. And this will, in, in my opinion, it's a, it's a good way to go about it because I'll go back to narrow it will kind of keep things neat and tidy. And when you're arranging, you don't want to be like copying a bunch of individual clips. Like if I wanted to copy these uh, wood percussions over, I would have to select them all and move them, right? And I might miss one. And if I get like a really big track with, um, you know, all my arrangement and they're just individual things. It's hard to keep track of what's going on. So for this, you know, for example, I will consolidate this. And this just consolidates the clips, right? It does not affect the audio. So there's a difference between um, freezing, flattening, and consolidation, right? I'm just going to consolidate, right-click, select this. It will create um, zero-value audio where it needs to be. I'll just consolidate and then boom, it just does that. But the effects remain the same. The automation, the automation remains the same, right? So there's a difference there. So there's that. And this is useful so I can, you know, not have to worry about selecting each one here. I can, well, I can shorten that, but let's set this to loop and it'll loop the beginning point, the end point automatically, which is what I selected. And I can move these things um, around like so. And uh, MIDI, I can select all of this, and I can actually consolidate this into one long MIDI track, or one long MIDI clip. And that gives me a really cool opportunity. I can, um, uh, let me just move this up here. I can move this kick around right? And do some cool stuff with that or have like a double kick at the end, which is a thing that we do. Right? Things like that, which is, you know, super, uh, super useful. MIDI clips in this way are, I mean, insanely useful. So we'll select this and then we'll loop it and it automatically creates a loop at the uh, start and end point. And the reason why is because say if I have something going on for a bar here with loops in the MIDI realm, if I move one, we'll notice that it will move them all in that kind of looped region. And that is a way to, you know, you change one thing, it'll change other things, right? But only in the context of it being in a clip there. If, it, if they're two separate clips, you move one and the other one doesn't necessarily do anything. I mean, it scales up to display all the notes, but it doesn't really do anything. So I hope that demystifies some of those questions. I think that is essentially it there. This file will be available in the pinned comment down below. Um, I hope you enjoyed that, I guess, workshop. It's uh, somewhat of an intermission. And yeah, I hope you stick around. We're going to be picking up the pace even more. Hope you enjoyed that video. I hope you learned stuff. Take care and see you soon.